Hi, welcome to my September reading wrap-up part 2. We'll talk about Tolstoy, Chekhov, The Iron King and Moby Dick. Here we go! The first book is Moby Dick by Herman Melville. If it has a whale on the cover and in the title, and if everyone says it's a book about whales, it might be a book about whales. <sighs> Apparently I didn't get the hint. Apparently I'm not that into whales. Not enough to read chapters upon chapters on their taxonomy and anatomy and philosophy. Other topics are discussed in the book as well, such as humans versus nature, civilization versus savagery, the meaninglessness of human existence, the quest for knowledge, racism, colonialism, America, and so much more. Before we continue, I must add that I appreciate the fact that I didn't come close to grasping Melville's genius. This book was a passion project and a commercial failure. This is one of the great American novels, after all. Maybe when I reread it in 50 years, my mind will be blown. Maybe right now I'm too dumb to appreciate it. Or maybe some people oversell it when they say that everyone should read it. I went into it thinking that it was a story about a captain's obsession with the white whale and that it was very profound and digressive. Well, I was right and wrong at the same time. The plot isn't as captivating as it might seem. It didn't manage to captivate even Melville judging by the number of tangents he went on. There are these almost encyclopedic chapters, which aren't entirely accurate by today's standards, and there are the more plot-driven ones. And most of the plot-driven chapters describe the mundane activities of will hunters, as experienced by Ishmael. I felt like the chapters on cytology were more about Ishmael showing off his knowledge than anything else. The first 20-something chapters are quite nice. Ishmael explains that he went to sea because he has a damp, dizzy November in his soul. He's interested in whales, to say the least. And although he understands that whaling can be very dangerous, he wants to do it anyway. He goes to the whaling capital and he has to spend a few nights there. He has to share the bed with a Polynesian harpooner named Quickweg. Quickweg returns pretty late and Ishmael is scared because this stranger looks like a cannibal. When he wakes up though, he sees that Quickweg embraces him as if he were his wife. Throughout the novel there are hints that the two of them are in a relationship, but it doesn't really matter if they're friends or lovers because whale facts are more important than that. This book is very dense and Ishmael's wittiness doesn't help. Millions of readers could enjoy his exegesis on whaling, but they don't do anything for me. I didn't read it for class, I read it for fun. And I don't mind digressions most of the time, but when the book is more about them, I guess I do. <laughs> when people say that they couldn't put this book down, I find it really hard to believe them. Yes, it's about subjectivity and symbolism, but it's still about whales. <laughs> if you read it and you asked yourself, why didn't I like this? I'm here to tell you that you're not the only one. I want to forget every whale fact I learned. I don't want to read any more PhD thesis on whales. I don't want to see pictures of whales. But somehow, the word sperm whale is still funny. The second book is The Black Monk by Anton Chekhov. In the beginning of the story, our protagonist, who is a scholar, is overworked and his nerves are off. His doctor tells him to take a break in the country and he goes to visit his former guardian and the guardian's daughter. The old man is obsessed with his garden and the young woman seems to be in love with our protagonist. Once Chekhov had a dream, a black monk who floats over the field, the same monk convinces our hero that he is chosen by God, that he can save humankind from suffering. The monk gives his life a new meaning. His purpose is to serve the humankind. And since he is the one 
with superpowers the chosen one, he must lead the others. Why does he see a monk rather than any other hallucination? Well, the most obvious explanation would be that he wants to marry the girl and monks are celibate. I guess that devotion to God or any other high ideal is incompatible with human desires. They could distract one from the truth. Our main character, Kovrin, understands that he's going insane, but he doesn't mind it. He feels better and he doesn't hurt anyone, so there's nothing wrong with it. The monk insists that everything that he sees is real. Is the protagonist actually mad? Is he a genius? Is the black monk an angel or a demon or a figment of his imagination? This became one of my favorite short stories by Chekhov, and I'll go into more detail about it in my Chekhov Where to Start video. Another book I read this September was a novella by Chekhov called The Duel. Leevsky is a self-indulgent aristocrat full of romantic ideas. He drinks, he gambles, and he lives with another man's wife thus scandalizing the whole decent society. He has grown out of love with her and he wants to leave her, but he can't do it without making sure that she has enough money to live on. He thinks that he could become a great man if only he escaped from this town and returned to St. Petersburg. His only way of dealing with problems is running away from them. He can't take full responsibility for his actions. He receives a letter telling him that his mistress's husband has died and therefore she is free to marry him, but he hides this letter from his mistress. Laevsky confides his problem to a doctor. One of the doctor's tenants is a zoologist and he really hates Laevsky. He thinks that he has a bad influence on the community. Because of him, everyone is drinking beer and gambling. The main conflict in the duel is between the two of them. Von Koren, the zoologist, thinks that Laevsky shouldn't have the right to reproduce, because otherwise there would be more parasites like him in the world. I liked the description of the duel itself, because it was so different from the romantic depictions. All men gather there, and what's next? They don't know what to do. <laughs> It's messy and it's ridiculous and I'm not giving you any context, I'm sorry. All these people are consumed by their passions and their tragedies and they're stuck in their worldviews. Loving thy neighbor is easy as long as your neighbor is exactly as you want them to be. The conflict arises out of boredom and the real one takes place within oneself. Becoming self-aware and giving up the desire to appear better than one is, is the path to overcoming oneself. I didn't like the ending, I felt like Chekhov had a certain conclusion in mind, but had no idea how to get there. The pacing wasn't the best, and it reminded me of The Shooting Party by the same author. You would think that if you enjoy the shorter texts of an author, you will like his longer ones too, but this isn't the case. Unlike Tolstoy though, Chekhov doesn't moralize, he simply shows, and I appreciated that. This is another short story I read in September. It's called A Nervous Breakdown. This story was written in memoriam of Sevalad Garshin, a short story writer who struggled with mental health and committed suicide. Chekhov himself wrote that this was a story about a young man, a Garshin type, a strong personality, honest and deeply sensitive, who finds himself in a brothel for the first time in his life. The poor guy finds this whole thing disgusting and vulgar. He wants to solve the problem, but he has a nervous breakdown. It captures the frustration of becoming acutely aware of a huge problem and wanting to solve it immediately. Not the most impressive story ever, but at least it brought some attention to women dying because of their horrible working conditions. The next one is Anna Round the Neck by the same author. It's about a girl who marries a state official twice her age. The man is a miser and he doesn't respect her relatives. In about 10 pages we see how the young woman changes her behavior after acquiring her new status. She doesn't have a passive role anymore and she becomes more confident. Basically, she surprises everyone. I'm not going to discuss the mask, misery and a horsey name because they're so short I'm gonna spoil them in one sentence. 
I wasn't a fan. On the other hand, I really enjoyed the farce A Marriage Proposal. It's about a young man who proposes to his neighbor's daughter and he can't finish his proposal because they keep arguing about their land, their dogs and other petty problems. It's very short and fast-paced and some people are surprised by how funny it is. They've probably read his most famous play, the comedy, The Seagull, and it's not funny at all. Chekhov himself wasn't too proud of this farce, but I have to say that it has something in common with the importance of being earnest. Next, I read the books for my French readathon, that is The Last Day of a Condemned Man, The Human Beast, and The Phantom of the Opera. You can see the reviews in the French readathon wrap up video. I also read The Iron King. The Iron King, Philippe the Fair, is surrounded by rumors, scandal, and intrigue. The Templar Grand Master Jacques de Molay is burnt at the stake and he curses his accusers, including the king. The curse will destroy the entire dynasty, or will it? Let's find out in the next books! <laughs> It's surprisingly fun to read. If you're not afraid of historical fiction and you like political intrigue and backstabbing, you might like it. It's something between A Song of Ice and Fire and Alexandre Dumas. I enjoyed it even more than I expected and I discovered that my grandma loves this series and she has decent taste in literature so we should trust her. Next I read Two Parables by Tolstoy or Tolstoy. God Sees the Truth But Waits, and The Free Hermits. You might enjoy them if you're interested in the Tolstoyan movement. I liked The Free Hermits more, so I'm gonna talk about it. Here, just like everywhere else, Tolstoy reasserts his idea that there's the right way to do things and the wrong one. And surprise! Tolstoy is right and the church is wrong. The church puts too much emphasis on rituals, and tries to fix things that are perfectly fine. For example, the hermits are perfectly fine praying in their own way with their own words, but no, the church has to come and educate them, it has to teach them the right words. The final scene is hilarious if you actually try to picture it. The next book I read was a comedy in four acts called The Fruits of Culture or The Fruits of Enlightenment. It's a satire on spiritism and the conflict between aristocracy and peasantry. After the emancipation reform, the peasants were free on paper, but in practice, not so much. The land still belonged to aristocracy, and to become financially independent, the peasants had to buy it. So free peasants come from far, far away to the main character to buy some land. The landowner refuses to sell it, and a maid decides to help them. She wants to fool the nobleman in a seance. It's a nice little play, but I think that it was more relevant and relatable back then than it is now. The next book is a novella called The Devil. It has something in common with the Kreutzer Sonata and I didn't love it. It's about a nobleman who really likes a peasant. Again, just as I said in the case of Father Sergi and the Kreutzer Sonata, Tolstoy thinks that lust is bad and that the best choice is abstinence. Once again, the main character doesn't believe that women are people. Karma is a book I actually enjoyed, but I didn't include it in my Tolstoy video. I guess I didn't have enough time to analyze it. It's a Buddhist legend retold by Paul Karras, retold by Leo Tolstoy. The style is very unusual, and you don't feel like you're reading something written by a Russian classic. It's basically Carlos Castaneda or any other esoteric writer, but it's Tolstoy. I also read What I Believe and A Living Corpse, but I talked about them in my Tolstoy video. Now you understand why this video has two parts. You can watch my Tolstoy video, my French Readathon wrap-up video, or the first part of this video. But for now, thanks for watching, bye!